I'd like to begin this talk with a question. I'll repeat it at the end. In between, I'll talk about a few ideas that help guide my research in literature and technology studies. It is, I admit, an odd question, one that might not make a lot of sense at first, but which I think is worth asking. In fact, sometimes I think it's the only question worth asking. The question is this. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Now, you don't need to know the answer to this question. There won't be a test at the end of this podcast. For the moment, it's not even necessary that you know what electric sheep are, let alone whether or not androids or iPhones or your mom's old toaster dream of them. That's the way with the kind of questions we sometimes propose in the humanities. They don't necessarily presume a single answer, a a yes or a no, but neither are they simply opportunities to express an opinion where every answer is as good as another. A good question in the humanities is one that provokes, troubles, maybe even disturbs us. It asks us to question what we know and the assumptions upon which the values which we know are based. It asks us to think beyond the familiar and the commonplace and to consider things that might, on first glance, appear counterintuitive, maybe even absurd. But somehow the question gets in our head and makes us want to follow the paths that lead out from it, to pursue the byways and detours, no less than the express lanes and thoroughfares of thought, wherever they might go. It might lead us to some unfamiliar place, a thought or insight that is wholly new, or it might take us back to some place we know, but to see it now in a different light. For me, and I'm hoping for some of you, do androids dream of electric sheep is just such a question. As oblique and as absurd as it is, there's something here that niggles at the mind, that makes us wonder. wonder. Perhaps it's not just the question, but the way it's phrased. The iambic pulse of the line, with each unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, and the run of D sounds and long E's. Do androids dream of electric sheep? It sounds almost as if it might be a line from blank verse, maybe from Christopher Smart or William Blake. It has much the same enigmatic quality as their poetry, and the same fascination with mysterious animals. But that poetical quality is at such odds with the topic matter. Great poets like Smart or or Blake don't write about androids or electric sheep, or do they? Do androids dream of electric sheep is, in fact, from a work of literature. But it's not from a poem, but from a rather strange and wonderful science fiction novel by Philip K. Dick. Today, Dick is best known for providing the source material for a number of CGI Hollywood blockbusters, Total Recall, Minority Report, Paycheck, The Adjustment Bureau. These are all based on stories that he wrote in the 60s and 70s. Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep, in fact, was made into a terrific film called Blade Runner. But as good as it is, and it really is, the book is better. Or at least the book is more willing to push at the moral and political issues at the heart of Dick's futuristic world. It tells the story of a bounty hunter named Rick Deckard, who is called in to deal with a group of androids that have escaped from the off-world colonies and are now back on Earth, illegally passing themselves off as humans. Deckard's job is to locate and destroy these rogue machines. But he has one little problem. The Nexus 6 androids are so much like humans that it's almost impossible to tell whether or not they are artificial. At one point, Deckard asks himself, If a machine is so much like a human, is it not then human? or if not precisely human, then at least worthy of the same rights and privileges that we accord to any thinking, feeling, desiring, being. In the post-apocalyptic world of the novel, nearly all the animals have become extinct, extinct, and the few that remain are now wildly expensive luxury items for the very rich. Deckard hopes one day to own an owl. 
He has dreamt of owls ever since he was a child, even before they became merely an entry in the history books marked extinct. If men dream of owls, do androids, electric humans, perhaps dream of an electric sheep? And if they do, what right has Decker to kill them? Wouldn't that be murder? Dick's novel thus asks a deeply philosophical question. What is it that distinguishes the human from the technological tools that humans have made? And how do we arrive at and maintain this distinction? What values and rights, what political and cultural norms does this line protect? And what will we do when we can no longer put our collective finger on that line? Those are some of the questions that I ask in my research, and in a first-year undergraduate course I'll be teaching this coming year. The course is called The Rise of the Machines, and it has the course number English 1028G. It's a first-year course, and it's open to anyone at the university. There are no prerequisites. The course explores the different ways in which literature has addressed the troubling liveliness of machines, the point at which they seem to claim an existence equal to, or in some cases superior to our own. The course offers an historical survey of literary texts from different periods, from science fiction classics, including Dick's novel, to contemporary graphic novels and Japanese manga comics. But it begins with E.T.A. Hoffman's short story, The Sandman, and Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, two texts that were published within a few months of each other in the early 19th century. This is the period in which a variety of technological innovations, including the development of the steam engine and the electric battery, were beginning to lend machines new powers to seemingly act and even think on their own. Uncanny. Such machines were so close to being human that they had a strange effect on those who came into contact with them, a feeling of what we call uncanniness. The word derives from the German, heimlich, or homely, familiar, recognizable. But by a curious twist of etymology, one that Sigmund Freud first noted in the 1920s, heimlich could also mean the very opposite, unheimlich, out of place, unfamiliar, alien, something that was at one and the same time familiar and strange. Today, engineers interested in artificial life use this term to refer to a common problem in the development of human-machine interfaces. The Valley of the Uncanny is the realm in which digital or physical approximations of the human face are so close to seeming human that users experience not a sense of comforting familiarity, but an almost visceral sense of revulsion or dread. The most famous example is the 3D rendering of Tom Hanks as the train conductor in the 2004 film Polar Express. As accurate as the 3D modeling for the film was, many viewers still intuited something inhuman in the actor's digital avatar and reacted poorly to the film. Some psychologists have speculated that this sense of revulsion stemmed from a sense that there was something not quite alive about the conductor and tapped into deep-seated fears of death. 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 Some might think it was just Tom Hanks acting. Whatever its cause, designers of robots and other machines meant to interact with humans have learned to avoid making the faces of their creations too lifelike. Users seem happiest when they can easily identify the machine as a machine and the human as human. The engineers at MIT didn't need poor Tom Hanks to discover the Valley of the Uncanny, that strange place where something seems both perfectly familiar and unfamiliar at the same moment. It's there already in Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1818. Victor's revulsion upon seeing his creature stir in the night and his subsequent quest to destroy his own creation speak volumes of the unease which our extensions stir within us. But it's also there, in a different way, in Hoffman's The Sandman, in Nathaniel's curious obsession for Olympia, a woman who is no woman at all, but rather a clockwork mechanism. Nathaniel is the first man to fall in love with a machine. Those things that most disturb us 
which draw out the death-like inhumanity within humanity, both terrify and fascinate. Tales of humans' relations to machines, I want to suggest, have a great deal to tell us about the nature of being human, and, indeed, how that concept, seemingly so fixed and stable, has changed over time. But they also open on to more troubling questions, such as the one with which we began. What if our machines are not merely mirrors in and through which we glimpse something of our deepest fears and longings? What if the machines, like the androids in Dick's novel, have their own secret secret desires, desires, lost loves, thwarted aspirations? How then would we have to rethink what constitutes the social and the political, the public and the private, the personal and the collective? In my research and teaching, I think it's worth asking, once again, Do androids dream of electric sheep?